The authority you hallucinate into government is not real. We've had a standing $5,000 challenge on my radio show, The No State Project, for about, my gosh, a few years now. If you can produce empirical evidence of a state and citizens, $5,000 cash. What it comes down to is freedom depends almost entirely on what is between your ears and what's between the ears of everybody else. There aren't two choices. There is no government. It's a hallucination because we imagine it to have authority that I can prove it does not have. Accountability is futile. There could be nothing so simple to understand, yet so difficult to convey. Although it has been illustrated in endless individual cases, people are unwilling to hear the truth about the institution of policing as a whole. They are a gang of thugs and that is all. Yet what it really boils down to is this. The police, the justice system, and the rest of the state has a conflict of interest. Like any other system or set of complex relationships, it is duty bound to protect itself and those within it. Yet because the police are made up of fallible human beings with faults, it is inevitable that some members will become criminals themselves, and accountability is at attack. So over time, policing becomes a haven for the maliciously criminal and psychotically violent. Um, and if you can see that's what government is, so I wouldn't say it's failed, that was always its function. Uh, versus what a free society would look like, it would be contractual, right? At least uh, people can compete in providing these services, right? Government has a monopoly in security. So let's look at what it is. Is the state, let's see, uh, state of Arizona, was there a state of Arizona prior to February of 1912? So the answer is no, right? Was the land of Arizona there? So is Arizona different from the state of Arizona? Heck yes. The state of Arizona is an act of Congress signed by the president. It's a, it's a piece of paper. The truth of the matter is, uh, the only person you can actually fix is yourself. Contrary to whatever every politician will tell you and most candidates and everything else, the, the problem isn't out there. And it's so easy to point to lots of nasty, horrible um, people doing nasty, horrible things out there and say they're the problem if we could just talk them into not being nasty, the whole world gets fixed. Um, the truth of the matter is the problem is almost always between people's ears. All right, let's look at it from a legal standpoint and see if we can see if there's any evidence. We know it's a an act of Congress, but let's look, at what a, uh, let's look at what a citizen is supposed to be, something they didn't teach you in any of these schools. It's Laurier versus United States. It's the United States Supreme Court, and they define a citizen legally as a member of the body politic owing a duty of allegiance in return for a duty of protection. These are reciprocal obligations, one a consideration for the other. What happens in Washington DC does not matter in the slightest. It is absolutely irrelevant to whether we have a free society or not. Consider this, I realize that sounds weird if you haven't heard haven't heard this sort of thing before. Consider this, what if tomorrow morning everybody in the country woke up and for some reason by selective amnesia they didn't know what the IRS was? Richard Kennedy, who's a IRS district counsel, said to me, you want me to say the Constitution's a piece of paper. Well that's stupid. And eventually they'd get letters that said, we're the IRS and you should give us a bunch of money. And they'd go, I don't know who you are, and they'd throw it away. That's the end of the income tax didn't take an election, it didn't take legislation, it took people no longer imagining an obligation to bow to a giant extortion racket. I think whether it's true or not is re what's relevant. It may be stupid, but is it true or not? So what's really stupid is you think four pieces of paper from 230 some odd years ago gives you and your client a right to my client's house. Now that's stupid, because if I said this piece of paper gave me a right to your house, you'd rightly, uh, you know, tell me where to go. That's all. It wouldn't take a revolution. You wouldn't even have to resist. You'd just ignore them out of power. Now what's going to happen is probably what always happens for a few weeks, from the, the media hype beast to the, those, uh, the, the protesters and the police apologists, everybody will just be shouting their little opinions out, um, and it'll die down. Similar scenario will occur months from now we'll revisit it repeat last video i covered the millions march nyc protest that demands among other things the abolishment
of the New York City Police Department. As long as we petition and we whine for or against this or that legislation and we vote and we cry to the masters and we protest to the masters. And that's right, not just reform, but termination of the institution. The one message that comes through is we agree that it is up to you, masters, what we are allowed to do. Let's break that down just a little bit. How did, the, how did the duty of allegiance and the duty of protection arise? Well, let's look at it. Are taxes compulsory or are they voluntary? Compulsory. compulsory. So could someone really have a duty to protect you if it's compulsory? Someone said Al Capone before, right? So given that you think government is necessarily coercive, right? Well, it is. I mean, okay, so you're, you're basically against any government yeah, whatsoever. You right. want well, of course not. It's all by violence. It's all compulsory. I, I mean, I don't like the term anarchy because it means other things, but I'm a voluntarist more specifically, and it's a, it's a fundamental belief based on taking the principle of nonviolence to its logical conclusion and saying that every human relationship should be free of coercion, should be free of violence. If we stop imagining that, they aren't anymore. Literally, what do you think 400 people in Washington would do if everyone else said, we don't really acknowledge your right to boss us around and take our money? This is a great opportunity to talk about an actual solution, which is what I've been advocating for I don't know how long, and that's the abolition of uh, the police. When people say, do you want to abolish government? I say, no, any more than I want to abolish Santa Claus. Now, when I usually say that, People just start pearl clutching at the idea. Of course, police apologize. Oh no, we can. Oh, if without the uh, uh, the government protecting our freedoms, there's no way that this society could be civil. People say, well, what about their enforcers? There wouldn't be enforcers. They're hallucinating it too. And then those is funny because those same types that also are, oh man, all the cops are pigs. They just racist. The injustice. The humanity, and when I talk about, all right, let's have, uh, abolish the police altogether. Let's come up with uh, private, uh, cordial community efforts. You think congressmen are going to go door to door saying, you got to give us some money? No, they rely on their thugs to imagine authority where there is none. And then they rely on their victims to imagine. Threat Management Center is about preventing threats from taking place. We believe in something called opportunity denial. We deny the opportunity for violence to occur by creating conditions which are conducive for having a good quality of life and preventing violence from ever taking place in the first place. Oh, well, wait a minute. Well, we need to police. Well, it's just, it's just, you know, it's a pipe dream. Huh, there, there's just no way that we could, we could ever last with, you know, without the police. They just need to beat us a little less. Not only is that not the solution, it is the problem. That, that is not a solution. That is not a solution. It is putting faith in the same entity that you claim oppresses you. When we stop hallucinating them as our rightful masters, they will stop being our rightful masters because they never were. We were taught to imagine that's what they are. Stockholm Syndrome is what it is. They just need to beat us a little less. We need to reform. They always love reform. We need the body cams. And they need to investigate themselves and so they can find no wrongdoing. But it's never about you know, coming up with our own efforts. The community's coming up with their own efforts. That's the only way you ever get to freedom because as long as you are begging the master for his permission to keep what you earn or run your own life or make your own choices, you're not even free inside your own head. People that are on the other side, the, 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 those apologist types, how do you lose with this? Unless you just want to say, well, I want to forcefully rule over these people and they go, this is have to, you know, you're being an authoritarian more than anything. You say, like, how do we deal with this voluntarily? Yeah. I'm more curious, how do you suppose that we would deal with mental health problems with force and coercion? If you truly believe in freedom, if that's the idea, it's the perfect scenario. Screw you guys. Let's come up with our own methods. Both the creation and the enforcement of the law are necessary for the system to function. And they get the, the individual that is a cop or a law enforcer they have the perceived legitimacy to enforce whatever laws discriminately accountability is a dangerous lie the system cannot be reformed the system is working perfectly as a system just the way it is is the core issue is the fact that there is an entity that has the power to do that start talking about it man in Detroit, when the police failed, 
the free market filled the void and private security forces started offering real protection that benefited even the middle and lower class citizens. Now that sounds like an absurd position on the surface. And spoiler alert, it's kind of an absurd position in the depths as well. Police do not stop crimes. Criminals have this tendency to commit their crimes out of the way of police. When police do arrive at an active crime scene, things generally just get worse. Because really it's a bunch of people with pretty little magic badges that you guys say that they're legitimate. And they just go around extorting people uh, and paying other people to provide said services. The legal system generally. Stop calling their commands laws. It gives it legitimacy. They aren't laws, they're threats. They boss us around and hurt us if we disobey. In our legal system, we have legislators and executives who create law and a criminal justice system that enforces and applies the law. The police enforce, the courts interpret and apply all within the confines of due process. Bullshit. I guess, you know, under the, the Fifth Amendment, it, you know, it says you're not going to be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. And, you know, no private property is, is, is going to be taken for public use. No private property is, is, is going to be taken for public use without due freaking compensation or process. Due freaking compensation or process. Bullshit. They ask you not to store any vehicle on the street for over 72 hours. And we, we normally will, uh, you know, we, we warn it first and cite it. And then if we had to after that, we end up having to tow it. Because, again, if we want it off the street, you can't store it on the street. And there it is. If they were really looking to protect your life, liberty, and property, they wouldn't be the first ones threatening to take it, right? But that's what they do. Well, pay us or we'll kill you. It's a huge extortion team just to, to control you and take your money uh, and to fund themselves, right? Stop calling their extortion taxation. It's not. It's just extortion. It's just as immoral as a carjacker or a guy on the street robbing little old ladies at gunpoint. The government has no duty to protect you, and they've told us that. There are many, many Supreme Court cases in Deshaney versus County of Winnebago. It's a direct quote. Police officers have no statutory duty to do anything. They have no duty to do anything, they said, so that includes protection. The vast majority of what our police are employed to do anymore is issue fines for traffic violations because they raise revenue for the state and bust drug offenders because this, again, raises revenue for the state. The institution of police has turned into little more than a racketeering scheme for local and state governments. All of the power they have comes from their victims hallucinating legitimacy to the extortion racket. And it's true of every other law that the politicians want to spew forth. If we don't hallucinate an obligation to bow and obey, they just disappear. They have no power. Authority is always in the eye of the beholder. If we imagine them to be our master, then they are our master. All citizens are member of the body politic. Duty of allegiance and return for protection. But there's no duty to protect anybody. What does that mean about allegiance? Does anybody owe allegiance? No! no. So if you don't have a duty of allegiance, you don't have a duty of protection, are there any citizens? No. no! Creating laws with no enforcement mechanism renders the laws meaningless. Enforcing the laws without a democratic mechanism of creating them renders the laws unjust. Here's a tough one. If you don't have a state, you don't have citizens, is there a government? No. But people need to understand what the state is and what poli police officers, what they are, being the, t the teeth of them, and why it's, it's, it's a bad model. It's a model that's designed to fail. And, and then with those services that both of those uh, guys provide, I have alternatives. There's no alternative to the state. And thus, you know, it's a bunch of legislators, they write the rules. The individual police officers, they get to enforce those or whatever because they have their pretty little magic badges, even though they look just like us. They, uh, you know, we, there's a perceived legitimacy with them and they can enforce the laws in whatever way that they want. So with that understanding, we can't advocate the abolishment of police without effectively advocating anarchy. Okay. And that's in the constitution, right? And the constitution is what? Uh, no, uh, that, that's an opinion. Tell me what it is factually. Well, the 
thank you. That, and this is, that's, that's the answer. Did anyone sign it? Did anyone sign it in any manner as a signatory or to make themselves responsible to it as an agreement? No. So it's just a piece of paper. They're not, nobody signed it in any manner that it could be binding as an agreement. As Lysander Spooner wrote in Constitution, no authority, no treason. The Constitution has no inherent authority. If it has any authority at all, it's as a contract. And it doesn't even purport to be a contract. And even if we accepted it, I'm going to paraphrase a little now. <laughs> even if we accepted it as a contract, which no court in the country, <laughs> so-called, would ever enforce the contract of the Constitution as a contract. If you did accept it as a contract, it only applied to anybody who agreed to it then. How about the military? Would you get rid of the military? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, our founders were against a standing army, and we've seen the consequences of having a standing army. We get into a lot more wars th than we should. The meaning and the effectiveness of our laws depends upon our ability to enforce them. Abolishing the police with no replacement law enforcement mechanism makes as much sense as abolishing the legislature. Not to say that, uh, you know, one is not doesn't want law and order. You're just under the, the guise and the impression that the only way that that can happen is if there's a monopoly on it. And that is false. So then what do we do when there are no police? We adapt. That is our greatest strength as a species. We recognize new problems and create new solutions. Coercion is always wrong, no matter what the excuse. But our, isn't our police force localized? I don't understand. Well, it's right. all provided by the government. It's all taken through taxation. Whether or not you like it, you pay for it. You know, that, those are the problems. Like, if you, ha if you can't re re uh, withdraw your support, then you really don't have any accountability in a service whatsoever. It's not the policeman's job to decide which laws he likes or not. He doesn't create them. He just enforces them. You know, a cop can arrest you, lock you up in a cage for a nonviolent, victimless crime. Like, you, if you want to smoke a little weed or you want to do something, collect rainwater, I don't know, you know. Police are required by their job to enforce laws, regardless of whether or not those laws are just. If I do that, it would be kidnapping. We like to have an environment free of violence, free of crime. Police officers and police departments are tasked with arresting people after they've broken the law. So if you think about it, the core values uh, and the metrics by which they are, uh, that they are measured, um, law enforcement way of thinking is based upon prosecution and ours is based upon prevention. And that's the core difference is we are in line with what normal people want. They want a life without violence and crime. And that right there is the core problem. The reason why we call it a mission <laughs> instead of a job is because a job has an expectation of um, the way we look at it. The job is an exchange, time for money. Mm -hmm. uh, a mission has no relevance to time or money. It has only the end result. So if we find people are despondent, emotionally despondent, uh, this is not going to work out for them. They cannot be a part of our organization. These are not policemen. These are mercenaries. These are murderers. That's what we're dealing with. If you're money motivated and you try to do protective service work in, as a professional, uh, for example, a mercenary, a person who trades time for money, you are automatically a coward at that person's highest time of need. Unfortunately, it somehow gets less coherent from here when we start examining what these advocates want as solutions. But these issues are what the advocates see as the problem, at least to the best of my ability to understand them. Communities will find needs that must be met and might do so with rational, compassionate, and nonviolent means. Most of the time, people just need help. Not emotionally unstable, low intelligent agents with guns who may imprison or kill you responding to community issues. You do not need a badge, a uniform, or a thin blue line to provide people the service of protection. Some sort of ambiguous community solutions for transformative justice or law enforcement through private means, either with a profit motive or purely for charity. So you, would you want to see policing privatized or what's, what's your, you just want communities to police themselves, abolish the police force? I want the individuals force? to come to their own conclusions and decide what they'd like to do for, for their own protection need. If we had no police force, we would have to take steps to protect ourselves, right? You're right. We should be able to protect ourselves. I think so that's very you, important. how do we do that? What, what do you mean? How do we protect yeah. ourselves? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I try to carry pepper spray everywhere I go. When I can, I can carry a firearm. Do you, have, do you have firearm or pepper spray with you right now? Since I'm in D.C., I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> More importantly, safety should be a do-it-yourself issue. 
Learn to defend yourself, both mentally and physically. Natural consequences are the strongest deterrent against crime. If criminals fear instant reprisal for their actions, they might think twice. Yet the current system causes potential and actual victims to fear legal consequences for taking matters into their own hands. This empowers criminals and police, but leaves the rest of us at a strong disadvantage. Some of the ways we help, um, let's say three of the primary ways, number one, we have a television show that comes on every Saturday here in Detroit. It's called Threat Management Center. It airs locally on Comcast uh, Cable TV. And what we teach on there is actually how to defend yourself. So okay. techniques of gun disarms, knife disarms, how to use psychology, law, and skill in that order to defend themselves against violent criminals. And that's every week. And that's been for approximately seven years now. Wow. And then uh, we also provide Free Family Friday, which is a free class here at our facility from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Any family can, can participate, and it's totally free, and they can come as much as they want. And in this class, they're taught actual gun disarms, knife disarms. They're taught how to get um, someone's hands from around their throat, how to escape is the primary uh, function of the class. We don't want a person to have to make a primal decision when they're faced with a self-defense uh, question. The police force should be determined by the market, essentially what you're saying. The service. What, hap what happens to those least equipped to pay for that service? Well, uh, like in any society, if you look back in history, like the less there was government taking, the more charitable things there were. You know, charities disappear because a lot of people, A, don't have the funds, or B, think it's being taken care of. Stalking and domestic violence victims are sent to our organization for protection. Uh, this is a community service for us. It's something we do for free. And so there would be, first of all, maybe people would just donate to help get those people protection. And uh, we help people that can't afford our services if their life's in danger. Something for your um, viewers to know that we actually help people if they need help. So if you have a domestic violence situation where there's, it's extreme, where they believe the person's going to be hurt, they can be referred to us. We will help them for free. It doesn't cost anything, and we'll help keep them alive. Being neighborly watched, you know, like I said, there's this application called Cell 411 where you can summon your friends, not just for physical emergencies, but uh, medical emergencies, car emergencies, and, and other things. It's hard to gather exactly what these advocates mean when they describe who or what replaces police departments to keep people safe and to enforce the laws. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, the Supreme Court case of Winnebago versus Shano County? You have? Okay, cool. They are not required to protect anybody. Is it just one Supreme Court that said that? No, it's several. Every Supreme Court has said that. Our role should be traditionally to be peacemakers, to be guardians and servants of the community. However, that role is evolved. So do you think that you're really filling in a gap where the Detroit Police Department and other law enforcement agencies are failing at serving the community? Well, I don't think it's necessarily that law enforcement's failing. I think it's just we have expectations that are outside of their scope of their duties. The police's sole responsibility is to manufacture criminals. No, no, no. The police's sole responsibility is to serve and protect the communities they are hired to represent. <laughs> Idiot. So you know then the police have no obligation to protect their life, liberty, or property. Oh yeah. This is according to a Supreme Court ruling stating very explicitly in Warren v. District of Columbia that the police are not obligated to protect you, but rather to uphold the laws of the government. Please do not deter crime. If this was true, the growth of the police state would have meant the end of crime by now. As it happens in this case, the amount of evil and destruction and damage and suffering that comes from hallucinating authority where there is none is just enormous. One culprit has remained hidden in plain sight, the state. Yet policing does create crime. Several generations of socially and economically downtrodden people have been filtered through the system long enough to destroy individuals, families, and communities. Right? So there you go. I mean, so, so then what's the point of the government if the government is supposed to protect you? This leads to cycles of crime, as the downtrodden are given narrow choices for their survival. It leads to the universities of criminal behavior that our prisons have become. Police have only one response to crime, which is to take advantage of it and profit from it. Crime is its nourishment, so it has far more to gain by creating it than stopping it. Our current system is accountable to the vote, <laughs> and so long as the only politically correct attitude of police criticism is accountability, they are safe from the logical conclusion that they are not necessary. An alternative system is accountable to the dollar, but either is accountable 
to the majority. Bullshit. Well, I feel sheepish. So this book government has to have a monopoly on the services you and I want, and which we don't have the economic freedom to cancel or unsubscribe as we could from a real business. Or to compete entrepreneurially to say, you know what, I can provide you a better form of security that's not going to be abusive or harmful to you. And they get to compete. You know, competing firms is, I think, the most important thing about that. And that's why the, the, the whole reform thing is just silly. But when government has these monopolies, uh, you can't. Uh, and that's why, as a result, you have uh, these atrocities. Like you have their monopoly of security robbing people, starting people, hurting people, uh, victimless crimes, so over 2 million people in cages, right? Uh, most of them for victims of crimes. Uh, the war on drugs is over 1 people. Majority votes for reform? It happens. This nigga's crazy. Majority pulls money away from a business? It dies. The problem here isn't accountability to the majority. The problem to these advocates seems more precisely to be accountability to them personally. Coercion is always wrong. And individually. And sorry, that's not the way a society with democratic values works. You get a vote, not a veto. And so what we're really proud of is that what we bring to the table are about a lot of heroic people. Uh, they're altruistically motivated to uh, create change in people's lives and keep them alive. And in 20 years, not per one person who came to us for help has been injured. Not one person wow. has been killed um, that came to us for help, and not one person on our staff has been killed. Six of us have been shot, one female, five men, and um, none of us had, had ever had to go to court uh, for civil or criminal reasons. So we've never had a situation go to the negative where uh, we cannot articulate it at the scene and create a positive outcome. So even if we ignore the actions of police violence, brutality, corruption, and failure, and pretend that every police officer in the country is Andy Griffith, the question, do we need police, is still quite clearly that we absolutely do not. Uh, our website is threatmanagementcenter.com, threatmanagementcenter.com, and our 1-800 uh, number is 800-525-3491. Well, people will go through and say, well, what about the roads? <laughs> so I, how many people you were willing to personally shoot to build a road? I'm glad to hear that. Is there anybody here who is willing to shoot somebody or take their house by force in order to build a road? The authority you hallucinate into government is not real. <laughs>